dear Stephen, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. In fact, I was very happy to come here to pay tribute to Sir Godfrey Hounsfield. I met him still when he was not Sir, he, but he was a very, very interesting, very nice colleague. Not too talkative, which I enjoyed much. And, uh, <laughs> he was just concerned about twiddling with problems and so on. Uh, so I'm very happy to be invited here. So Linus Thompson, just to say, also a physicist, professor of physics. So it's a great honor. Thank you. Uh, I was asked to talk about exactly the title you see listed here. Uh, and, well, I'm happy to do that. That's much better than, like, 20 or more years ago. Everyone said CT is dead. So apparently now the expectation is that possibly maybe some further developments I will try to go into that. It is a very broad topic, of course. Technology can be anything, including uh, software, picture archiving, whatever you want to have. And it's uh, difficult to cover everything. So I try to uh, also to guide you through the lecture, uh, set up a scheme, and comment on uh, these uh, selected topics here. Of course, we have to start with state of the art. That's sensible to define, then where do we go from there? We saw similar. Uh, and numbers and statement already earlier today, and this is just RSA 2010. You might say, well, we didn't even change the slide. Absolutely correct. I only amended the slide because 2010 and 2011 were absolutely identical with respect to these key performance parameters of uh, the high performance scanners. Of course, you can always get a slower. Uh, scanner less powerful, but this is kind of the measure that we are looking at where we have to go from in deciding uh, what technology or the technological improvement there may be. So the rotation time that is kind of stable, they, mostly they are below uh, 0.3 by now. Slice width, I think that's the best message uh, with respect to radiological practice. We have around 0.5 to 0.6, and that is very important with respect to. 3D isotropic resolution, as we heard already today. Uh, the number of slices, I will comment on that later. That is, I will stress that 64 is a pretty good compromise. Um, we might or should be possibly be happy with that for standard practice. And the coverage per rotation results from that. Uh, whole body exams can be done in very short time. I will show one example there to impress you with the fastest that is around. And scan range is kind of unlimited due to the spiral principle also. And uh, um, one major topic which you might think is not technology, but which I include here is effective dose, because dose management uh, demands both hardware and software adjustments. And I consider that as a point in technology just the same. So I'd start with just two short uh, statements on X-ray tubes and detectors. With X-ray tubes, I do not forecast major developments. There are two technological concepts that you are aware of. In the, it started around the 1980s and then continued with the advent of the introduction of spiral CT. We noted that Q power was very low, or too low for many applications. And all that happened over about two decades was making the uh, tube, the rotating anode, bigger and bigger so it had more uh, capacity for absorbing and storing heat. And that was one development. We're doing quite uh, well with that, although we have very heavy and expensive tubes by now. An alternative development, which actually was uh, triggered, I was the uh, lucky one who could convince the Siemens engineers to go into a complete new technology that is not the anode itself, just the anode rotates, but the complete vacuum vessel. If you have that, you can cool the anode directly, and then you do not need a big anode anymore, actually quite the opposite. So you can come to a much higher long-term uh, uh, power level, and also to smaller size and weight. But right now, both are around, both offer very high performance values, and it's like 80 to 120 kW are the typical. Uh, values noted, and it will depend on the focal spot size, and that will not change. So there is no new technology which can meet the laws of physics. And if you have very small focal spot size, you will go to lower uh, power values. But one thing which is overlooked and again and again, if you go to wider cone beams, then you cannot use a very small anode angle uh, to make the optic uh, to make a large electronic. A focal spot look like a very small optical focal spot, 
and you cannot do that, and then you have lower power levels than that, you will see that if you have, a, for example, a 320 uh, row detector. So, but nothing new on that front. I do not expect big things happening with respect to X-ray tubes. Could be a similar statement with respect to the detectors, then again, no. What is amazing and interesting these days is that the manufacturers are marching quite a uh, bit in synchronously there, it appears that was the case when they uh, went to four row detectors, 60 row, 64 row detectors. They all did it at the same time uh, without talking to each other as much as I know, but it was kind of a uh, necessary development. And you see here such a typical module. I was happy to see that was shown earlier today already by Dr. Uh, by, uh, dear Ellie. I don't want to pronounce her name wrong. So <laughs> He's up there. And, uh, uh, and she, well, told me this is from GE, absolutely right, but I will try in this talk to avoid manufacturer names. It's not a competition between manufacturers that I want to spur here, but to give more general and generic messages. So here you see a single model of one detector of one manufacturer. Here you see a complete detector of another manufacturer, but it looks similar, doesn't it? And what we learned from this, of course, you could both extend it in the fan direction to cover a larger field of view. You can just say extend it in the Z direction, as is well known. Uh, so the technology is there, and there's nothing really new. What we have to worry about, or what we sh should think about, is with these detectors, more or less all manufacturers right now, they think of uh, scatter radiation uh, 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 removing devices, it's a typical grid, and you see one here, uh, again from a different manufacturer, that's drawn to scale, and of course, you are losing geometric efficiency, and the smaller, if you're dreaming, and you should, I'll show you some ways how we can get to higher resolution, if you want to have higher resolution, you have to consider smaller pixels, uh, or detector uh, elements, and then the geometric efficiency will go down more and more because these structures cannot be uh, reduced arbitrarily, both for mechanical reasons and also for absorption. So we have a problem uh, that no one talks about, uh, of geometric efficiency. They are 100% efficient. They, that's a claim in this direction, if there is the photon there. But if it is here, no one talks about it. So geometric efficiency is something to consider for future detectors, and I will uh, get back to that. So how is it with, in general, with the slice race, as the Americans termed it, going to more and more slices? Is that, uh, should we expect that to happen? To some degree, it will happen. We heard today there is cone beam uh, tomography, I think, for special applications. I will also show cone beam CT with flat detectors later. I think there we will have it. But for clinical CT, I do not forecast this. Anyways, the technology, standard technology is there, which would offer it, but there are some uh, things to consider. It is above all the scattered radiation intensity, which will go up. Uh, there's no way against it. You can use grids, and you will reduce your efficiency. So I'm always looking at dose efficiency. If you have that in mind, you should not necessarily go to very wide detectors. Also, with respect to available X-ray power to larger cone beams, there is some uh, negative effects to be considered, and also for dose optimization if you're using automated exposure control. If you cover, have a big detector covering the whole anatomy, you cannot adapt the tube current to a specific area. Transition, for example, from uh, lung to liver, so it will be much wider beams, and the optimization is limited there. So there is one conclusion with respect to the detectors, I think that the slice race is over. There are, of course, some special scanners. Uh, generally, we are quite happy with 64. And all those who have a 30, 320 row detector, they may confirm that spiral CT or whole body scans are simply done as recommended by the manufacturer with 64 row collimation. And I think that's, good. that's a good recommendation. But there is some good news with respect to detectors. I expect some developments in the near future, so-called directly converting materials like cadmium telluride and other developments are on the way and I'll comment later. And one additional thing is it is not just the horsepower race who has the most rows. I think it should be dose efficiency and image quality. In the race for image quality, there is quite a bit going on. That is, for example, simple things that we do not see, like the electronics uh, to have 
kind of noise-free measurements. That's one particular topic where I'm optimistic that we will have higher quality available. Then, of course, the alternative to wider detectors but cover the anatomy faster one, way, uh, one uh, proposal was and is dual source CT. In this case, it's only one manufacturer who offers it uh, successfully, I think nearly 1,000 uh, installations in the field, yet it is just a single one who offers it. So I'm hard to say, is this state of the, uh, of the art at present, or is this just an exotic solution? Anyways, what they claim, and actually I was involved in the development, what I also claim is it's the easiest way to double the power that is available by using two sources, of course. It's much easier than to develop some exotic X-ray tube, which no one uh, managed to do anyway. Uh, we have, that was pointed out uh, very nicely today already, with two tubes and combining data adequately, we have half the effective scan time necessary. So for this type of scanner, this 280 millisecond rotation time, the quote is 75 millisecond temporal resolution. That is very nice. And of course, there is dual energy that's a topic for the future. And the trick here is if you have two separate sources, you can use different filtrations. And the, the goal is always to separate the two spectra so that you have a better separation of the different materials and atomic elements in the beam. Um, what is done here that for the high uh, KV setting, you use additional filtration tin is the most popular there to separate the spectra and to have a better energy resolution. So that's what it offers. Uh, we know in general it is very fast. I don't, we saw that to some degree today already. I would like to demonstrate it if my uh, wakes up. Uh, one, you see, you have seen things like the one on the right often enough, that's easy enough, but maybe you have not seen the speed of acquiring the data. So if you look at it, and you may have a second look, this is exactly a, kind of little, a little bit of fiddling around with it. The time it takes to go through here, that's exactly the scan time. So it's a 1.8 second scan for the whole body trunk. Uh, we had the discussions uh, this morning, what do you do, what can you do, like uh, children are the uh, uncooperative patients. It is easier to forget about, uh, well, uh, anesthesia in the worst case of sedation if you know it's just a very, very short time where you have to distract them and it works. And we are quite happy with that. Oh, sorry. That was one too much. <laughs> no intention. And of course, what is the specific uh, advantage there? We also heard that we have a high temporal resolution. So uh, it is, in some cases, uh, radiologists, cardiologists want to see all phases, or is it just systole uh, and uh, diastole? That's one thing, or have complete movies to see, valves moving, and so on. That, of course, is offered here. But why I chose this slide, uh, slide is simply to point to uh, developments which are going on. I think the uh, retrospective um, reconstruction or uh, retrospective gating approaches, which actually I am 100% responsible for that. I uh, did that, I developed that in the 1990s, and I'm happy that it's over. At the time, there was no other possibility. We didn't have the fast scanners. By now, it's very clear that what we call a flash scan or others just the same. We have such short rotation times now that we get to uh, effective scan times which are good enough so we can do it in a prospective way. So retrospective high-dose scans should be reserved for special applications. <coughs> there is the indication I think it is okay. But here we see that suddenly we have below one millisievert given here as a uh, measure, and that was actually for, uh, I think, 61 patients or something, which were done uh, in Allen, uh, with without any selection, uh, uh, no randomized, no nothing involved. It was just uh, taking uh, the patient as they came in, and they were all uh, below one millisievert, and actually all uh, very good diagnostic scans. So that was kind of the first part I'm trying to get you back here. Uh, I would like to make a few more uh, comments on spectral, functional, and molecular, but actually functional and molecular uh, will be covered in the next two talks after mine, so I keep that very short, just give hints, but I will give some uh, added or uh, ex more extensive comments on spectral. I did not 
because of time reasons, uh, prepare or select many examples of what's going on. You may know that, for example, FDA has approved uh, by now uh, eight, eight for sure, more than 10 applications of uh, dual energy CT. So apparently, it's a, an interesting new application. What is also interesting, as we are paying tribute here to uh, not only Godfrey Hauptsfield, but also uh, science in England, it was in the 1970s already, the first dual energy scans were done here. Uh, in the UK, of all physicists, it's great fun. With respect to physics, it worked. I think it was uh, Ian Cunningham and others who showed that. So that was the first approach technologically. Then in the 80s, it was rapid KD switching. That uh, uh, was my baby also. We enjoyed doing that at the time, but then gave up on it when spiral CT can, uh, because we had to be fast, and then there is not enough uh, time for that. Then novel detectors that is taking cadmium telluride, cadmium zinc telluride, or other materials which allow energy discrimination when you analyze each single photon. Uh, they have been announced since the 1990s. There is none around yet clinically. Uh, and there was dual source CT in the uh, 2000s, 2000 to 2010. I dare to say that 2010s until 2020 and so on will be more um, uh, decade of spectral CT, as everyone is engaging. And the interesting thing is, we have all the concepts which are listed about here, they show up again. GE is doing rapid KD switching which much, with much improved uh, X-ray uh, technology and very fast uh, detector materials. Nevertheless, this is kind of difficult, but uh, they have very nice results. The model detectors that's mostly announced at uh, present by Philips, but others, they are all working on it. Dual source is kind of which uh, the technology which is available, which gave the whole thing so much uh, momentum. And Toshiba is going back to two separate scans, but of course they can do it. They have coverage of up to typically in clinical situations 10 to 12 centimeters. So if the organ or the anatomic region is enough, they can do simply by continuing in rotation. The scans are only separated by a few, uh, it's all done within a second. So that is uh, an approach just like here, but here it works. So we will hear much of that. What is important uh, to, to look at the quality, um, that's shown here. What we have to look at, uh, dual energy is a very difficult thing. Uh, it is, well, just the physics, it's about all signal to noise ratio. And you, what you want to do is for all pixels or voxels, you have to decide what is, is it calcium or not, for example, to remove bone in automatic fashion. And this was done with even the spectra, 18140, further away. Here in a separate, in a different patient there, it was less of a difference, thereby giving you much more X-ray power and penetration, but using added tin filtration to have a better uh, separation and a correct classification, what is calcium, what not, and removing it. Never, if you look at uh, closely at dual energy, no matter which uh, manufacturer it is, uh, these pictures are not perfect, but in many cases, it gives you very good and uh, disease-specific information. But it's not a miracle like spectroscopy that they can tell us this is calcium, this is not. It is, uh, depends on the technology that you're using, but in all, it's one of the hot topics. This is just to show you, yes, uh, the 320 row detectors, uh, they offer the great advantage. You can do continuous scanning of a limited area, so if the typical 12 centimeter, because you, uh, they, they offer 16 centimeter on the axis of rotation, but most organs extend towards the periphery from the axis of rotation, which is, mathematically speaking, has zero extent. Uh, and when you get away, your field of view shrinks. That's why I'm stressing. It's typically 12 centimeters, which they can cover. So that's very nice for the brain, in this case, also for myocardial. And it's all about perfusion. And that, of course, I would like to leave up to the upcoming speakers, also to the ego. And uh, the only thing which, and I will not talk about molecular imaging, that is apparently PET-CT, the combination of CT and PET, I uh, would only I like to tell an anecdote because uh, Professor Christian Kuhl from Aachen, Germany, last year, uh, the ECR, they actually had a great talk about uh, MR, 
uh, mammography, and she started with the statement, MR, imaging of the breast is molecular imaging because we image perfusion. In that respect, CT can also be called molecular imaging. So I agree with her immediately, and I do so here even in public. Um, well, there is no, uh, no law against uh, the use of the term molecular. Anyone can use it. And sometimes I think it's stressed a little bit too much, and we should be honest once. It's just perfusion, not truly. Uh, oh, she said initially it's, she's imaging angiogenesis. That is, uh, even with these, uh, of course, this is kind of, you could say, you see angiogenesis, true. Um, but if it is molecular imaging, let's not discuss it here right now. I would like to go into the next topic, which is new ways of image reconstruction. That's a bad topic uh, to uh, kind of ex explain here. Uh, it is simply a difficult approach, and I decided not to show too many slides. But uh, this is, I think, impressive enough, and all manufacturers uh, are engaged in it, and quite successfully showing that the images look more pleasing because noise is removed. Sometimes it's always said that they look plasticky because you have patches which don't have any noise anymore and apparently uh, the radiologists are addicted to noise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well if there was no noise everyone could interpret the images. <laughs> Maybe it just occurs to me, I never thought of it that way. So in any case, here also to give credit to uh, the, the big four manufacturers, they're all engaging in it, and uh, GE started with it. Uh, and they have all their acronyms. What I can say and confirm is all black boxes. They don't say what they really do, and maybe they don't know. No, I know that the engineer, the engineers know, or some, at least two or three of the physicists know. Your friendly sales representative who visits you does not know. You shouldn't blame him. It is a difficult uh, subject. And it's always, whenever you see an IR hidden somewhere, it's iterative. Um, what is uh, the status? There are also the only uh, two software packages have received clearance by the FDA, so they are considered safe and efficient. And that is good, and but only one is allowed to make the claim that they reduce dose. Because if you reduce that, if you reduce noise, you could reduce noise by increasing dose. So you have a dose equivalent for each noise, which is simply the uh, the square root law which you have to apply there. And so Siemens is allowed to claim 60%. So that tells you the order of magnitude that we're looking at, and it is uh, statistical considerations. And for example, to make it more maybe illustrated, one thing is that all those rays that go through a, a long direction of very high attenuation, you know the data must be noisy, so they are used with less weight in the reconstruction. It's all kinds of such considerations which are uh, not really uh, detailed anywhere, uh, but that's the general approach. One other thing which is more easy, hopefully, to understand uh, is the model base. What is model base? You can model any physical uh, effect that you know of, and very easy it is with respect to the geometry. So if you look at a standard CT image reconstruction, there's always you assume a point focus. The focus is just a point, and the detector pixel that you uh, uh, represents the data point that you are using for reconstruction is also considered as a uh, point. And the voxel, just the same, is just represented by its uh, center point. Now, of course, you can, if you have enough uh, power, computing power, you can use the area of the focus and have many uh, more, uh, equally distributed arrays which go also to different points on the uh, detector pixel. And then they also go through different parts of the voxel. And thereby you definitely uh, get better spatial resolution. And I think that's a very nice development. We are person of, I'm personally very happy about it. Because what you see here, uh, I got lots of beating in the 80s when I uh, well developed and also was uh, uh, distributed as a product, metal artifact reduction. I made it a point to call it an for reduction because that's also an ill post problem where you cannot have a perfect solution. But so I call it reduction. Salespeople forgot about the R. <laughs> it, was, it was like a, a cure for all, which it cannot be. So 
you know, this is uh, we are working here with small objects uh, where it's easier also to use these uh, iterative reconstruction methods for time computation time reasons. So this is kind of a standard image. If you see have a metal object there in this mouse phantom, you can use interpolation-based correction. That's what uh, I started in the 1980s. They are still around. They work to some degree, at least to make the image more pleasant. And you should always look. Uh, people or they will tell you that the signal is extinct because you have metal here and no photon can go through there. Of course they do. Uh, it is the problem is mostly partial voluming for the rays which go tangential to this and uh, to this absorbing uh, structure. And there, that's now the neat thing about uh, model-based iterative reconstruction. Here, looking both at the geometry and also as a model doing a spectral correction, so that both beam hardening is drastically reduced and uh, uh, the geometry-related artifacts are also reduced. And you can see these artifacts are drastically improved. We have a little bump there still. But so I think that iterative reconstruction, all kinds of variations that will come up, will improve image quality. There is hope that computing power goes up further. I think they will be good. I mean, some of you have made the experience already. They are not deterministic in uh, analytic reconstructions. You know what you will get. Here, there's some algorithm which plays around with assumptions. That's the statistical aspect. And you may or may not always be happy. And um, here, these two comparisons, you may have, uh, have recognized already where the problem is. In this case, what is shown here, this zone of uh, hyperdensity, kind of the, the algorithm decided that doesn't look good and obscured it. However, then doing the, um, the checking the case in the most uh, conventional way that is by end geography, we see it that this is a case of clear intima proliferation. So this is right, this is not right. And that I've heard other cases Manufacturers don't talk about it too much. I shouldn't either because I think iterative reconstructions are truly very promising, but they have to be uh, taken with some care and caveats. So here I am, special scanners. And uh, what is to be mentioned there? We just heard already in the, uh, two talks ago that there are scanners around with huge flat detectors. And actually, that development uh, is now that started in the late uh, 1900s, the last decade, quite a bit. And it was all triggered by the transition from image intensifiers to these neat flat detectors, which also allow faster readout and so on. So we now have so-called cone beam CT also in the hospitals. And you see such units there. What they do is, well, by now, they are quite fast. So you can even have well, if you want to call it molecular imaging, I would simply say that is, that's not even the fusion imaging, because what they do there with these two successive scans assess cerebral blood volume. But that in itself is also the neat um, uh, parameter, and it allows you to compare if your intervention was successful or not. So they're mostly used uh, for interventional procedures because uh, we do not have the highest of image quality, we can be forgiving, because what you're looking at, you will see it. But you, and I'll point to other examples there, but uh, it's combing artifacts and other things which may show up, but it is very practical, and radiologists, as much as I know, we enjoy working with CBCG. I don't know if they all enjoy uh, working with these machines, but to make them even faster, and well, that I was in, involved in these really fun, you know, the bigger the boys, the bigger the toys. So uh, just a conventional sea arm is not good enough if you have a strong robot who can rotate it at very, actually at much less than a second. You just wouldn't want to work nearby. You're not allowed to, you're not allowed to get anywhere close. So uh, how intervention can be done if you're not allowed to get close to the patient and the patient is not, uh, is to be instructed not to move and might even see the thing might uh, follow. Uh, yeah, so we have to uh, kind of uh, castrate them and just only allow them to move slowly. Uh, but that, that has many advantages, as for example, these detectors, this is at best 40 centimeters, 
CCTV detectors, which I showed earlier, they are about one meter. So the field of view is much reduced. The robot, if instructed and programmed cleverly, can do simply two scans, uh, which are then combined, uh, because you, you can change the geometry freely. A robot loves to uh, move freely. You should not allow him to do that, but uh, it would be dangerous. Uh, but if he does as told, so he suddenly have quite a, uh, an acceptable field of view in this case. Although normally you would have less than 25, here you have, I think, I don't know the exact number, I don't want, that's 40 centimeters for sure. So this is a technology which you may see more on these uh, scanners are around, that's just an amendment. What I like about it is we are talking about combination imaging. PET-CT is one example, PET-MR, uh, right now also. In these scanners, uh, COVID-CT actually is also a combination uh, device because it gives you not only CT data, but it also gives you fluoroscopy because it's a standard C-arm which can be used for any type of intervention, fluoroscopy whatsoever. So I like these concepts. I think they will also contribute to the spectrum of CT in the future more strongly than you might uh, think right now. Now with respect to the last one, the robot of course is a huge system and a very strong system. What is a tendency, definitely in Germany, I do not know how much it is in the UK already, that is to have small dedicated scanners. This is just here for, they try to avoid the term CT because if they call their devices CT scanner, then they are submitted to all kinds of regulations and they, you might even be, uh, have to be trained before you operate it. <laughs> so somehow they get away with it, but uh, I think it's not correct and I'll show you some examples why I think so. But anyways, it's neat. They have some uh, more elegant small scanners, they're mobile and so on. That is around. Uh, also, there are new scanners announced, and we are working some of that for very versatile peripheral uh, orthopedic uh, scans. And they are not uh, well, just very few installations around, but I think that's a tendency which will increase and will continue. But where we have lots of installations, it's these so called maxillofacial uh, scanners. They get away with the name Digital Volume Tomograph. I think that's a very picturesque name. But again, so it's not CT, it's TVT. And uh, uh, there are in Germany by now more than 3,000 installations. And that's a tremendous number because every a dentist, if he is, uh, has a budget, he can do it. And uh, there is no special CT education uh, demanded. And that is maybe not so good because we did some tests there. I, did, I don't like the situation. I didn't like it so far. Why not provide some proof in that word? As you can see here in German language, you might enjoy reading that. Uh, comparing four state of the art scanners and compare the results to standard, well, actually, it's a Somatome 64, an older scanner. And what uh, we did there is to set the MAS so that they have about the same. Uh, those measured with a CTI phantom, which should be the case as we do CT, and look at the results. Well, it's obvious that apparently they are not so great. They claim, and that's always a marketing trick, they report their pixel size uh, or whatever as resolution. And this is simply the comparison with measured resolution. Of course, they claim, they, they always claim that they have higher resolution at lower dose, and that's why they're good and better than CT. But it's certainly not the case. As you can tell, general image quality, also noise is much better here, uh, artifacts is much better here, and resolution is the same, dose is the same. So there has, I think the developments shall continue, I think it's good, but there has to be some control and regulation. And to set a good example, uh, I, I started in the same arena with a new scanner concept that's breast CT, and I take the liberty here to kind of um, report on that and promote it because I think it could be close to a perfect scan in the future because what it will use is photon counting technology, which also allows for energy discrimination by virtue of cadmium telluride sensor materials, and it will also have 100% geometric and absorption efficiency at least close to. Well, what it does. Or if you, you may have heard of these direct conversion materials before, I would like to explain nevertheless for those who have not 
Whenever you have a scintillator, and all CT detectors are scintillator materials, so you have an X-ray coming in, then light is created, light goes in all directions. CT detectors, they have to encapsulate the, um, the elements that, to avoid crosstalk, and that's why geometric efficiency cannot be anywhere close to 100%, but it is the light here, it gives you some kind of a, uh, a distribution. Now the direct converters, they do not go by a light, but they can uh, convert uh, the X-ray energy directly to charge. So you have charge, no, I'm sorry, this, this one here is still a scintillator, but they, the claim is that you have structured scintillator and everything is fine. I would say things are improved, but they are not fine. Because if you have, if you can forget about the light uh, as an intermediate, form there completely and have the direct conversion of the X-ray energy to charge, which is due to uh, high voltage, well, which is typically 400 uh, volts or so, it's not really high. Uh, you suck it off directly and you have no spreading. That at least is a model and we're getting pretty close to that. So that will be used and based on that we can get to much higher uh, Resolution in this case, it is assuming uh, in a detector which is there already a 100 micrometer detector pixel size because we have 100% geometric efficiency. We can go to such small sizes without losing efficiency. And you see here the first uh, that if you have 100 micrometer resolution, that is a pair uh, would be then 200 micrometers, so five line pairs per milliliter. That is exactly what we want to achieve. You can see it is resolved. This is a radiograph, a radiograph not a CT. But, uh, but the point is clear. And the way it is done, uh, we heard also today, uh, with respect to CVCT, absolutely right. They suffer from very low projection rates or frame rates. We here have a plan that works with 1,000 projections per second. So the scan can be done in typically one to two seconds per section that we choose and all this also allows for energy discrimination and the reason why we do all this is i forgot to mention or to stress it this is all about a ct mammography to develop a 100 percent but uh, efficient a ct scanner for that approach because as we all know uh, sensitivity of early detection of breast cancer is quoted at around 60 to 70 percent there is right now a tendency to provide a 2.5D tomosynthesis, and it has been accepted by FDA as efficient because in a larger study they showed that the sensitivity of 66% was uh, increased to 76%. So there are two messages learned from that that still miss at least a quarter, but more important, the whole study it was uh, one had just a single uh, breast a mammogram, the other had Total since you scan plus a uh, mammogram. So uh, it is unclear what we want to do. Uh, the expected results based on preliminary measurements and simulations were printed in European radiology in the January issue on page one. They said that's impact factor arithmetics, but they had to place it there. And the messages are here. We expect for a CT scanner of that build, and it can be. Uh, use generally uh, that we have a resolution much better than 100 micrometers and that we can also discern single microcalcifications 100 micrometer to the part and 100 micrometer diameter. We will have much better lesion detection, soft tissue lesion, than with any other uh, modality that is claimed, and all that can be done at those levels of 2 to 4 milligrade. If you don't believe it, uh, too bad, but the, uh, the reviewers of the paper believed it, so it got a different. No, I'm sure uh, we can reach that performance. And this is just all we have right now that is shown uh, respective lesions and respective clusters of microcalcifications. And the approach will always be to look at the results at different levels of resolution. So here's low resolution, low noise, so you see. Uh, lesions, soft tissue lesions, and this is very high resolution and uh, high noise, nevertheless, for micro calcifications, you can discern them very nicely. So, as you ask about uh, technology uh, improvements or developments, this is one major thing which I think will happen that combines 
things like the image reconstruction, this model-based iterative reconstruction, new detector developments, uh, single source only in that case for the uh, for the rest. I would like, if the chairman allows me, go briefly into those uh, management issues, uh, spreading the message. Oh, I apologize. You have to learn German now. Effective dose up here, and this is background radiation. It shows a wrong slide. I'm sorry. And all it says that in, uh, and I would really pay tribute there to uh, the English or UK system to HPA for once. All I don't get beaten up, but uh, they invested in things like this to determine, uh, to come up with schemes to determine effective dose to monitor it. So Europe is much better off. We have numbers of what are the typical values. So we know if we look at uh, these here on average, we are on average around five millisievert uh, per exam. And that is an accepted number. Now what is of interest, there is quite a number of developments which took place only after all the data were, uh, were taken. Uh, I go back once, uh, oh, wrong direction, sorry. Uh, these were, you have to look at the numbers here. So this was 1992 to 205 and so on. So all the new developments <coughs> like tube current modulation, automated exposure control, uh, dynamic shearing and so on are not included there. So I was uh, invited last year to by NIH to give a talk if there is a possibility of a sub receiver CT. So now that we have results on iterative reconstruction, which we didn't have last year, so nonetheless I was bold enough and said, yes, we can. That's popular in the United States. And, uh, <laughs> and I always like it if you have all these factors here, uh, how you uh, reduce things, uh, that is one thing, or you can do, uh, look at the preferably as the percentages, because if you add all the reduction percentages up, actually you reduce more than 100 percent of the dose. But anyways, if you believe the point two, and I think that is realistic, then the average dose of 5 millisievert, which was in the uh, past decade, we would be at exactly 1 millisievert. And I think that is realistic or will become part of CT with appropriate support by the manufacturers further on. And uh, I'm optimistic there, and this is from my good friend Stefan Nachenbach. He sent me that slide where, just using the general uh, conversion from VLP to E, he claims 0.07. So I told him you should please send me all the images. I would like to redo the calculations, but haven't received it yet. But nevertheless, we, uh, we have to be serious about all these things. I sneak these slides in, and I'm running over and apologize, but I got the question, how do you do DLP to E? It's a British invention, and I think it's very good. You just have to do all the Monte Carlo uh, calculations, and you get all the doses from that to derive effective dose, and if you have effective dose, and you know the DLP, you have these conversion factors, which you then use from there on to eternity. That would be nice, however, we know that ICRP takes liberty to change all this uh, uh, tissue sensitivity data now and then, all kinds of things. Also, what we did here, it relates to adults only, and we want to, uh, above all, include uh, dosimetry for children, for newborns, even we have respective phantoms. So this work on the way, also all these conversion factors for children are available by now also, and there is also programs which allow you uh, with, to enter any a parameter that you want and then get uh, the results and also not only technical dose but also patient dose and I only uh, give patient doses but never risk because I think it's not uh, a sincere or responsible thing to talk about risk in the low dose natural environment range. So maybe you mentioned it earlier, you scanned it already, the statement is there is a number, there will be no revolutions uh, in the near term. I think it's more continuous developments which continue and dose management and communication I think is very important because people just, too many people these days believe that each single ray can kill and we do not know how many rays are around. Thank you very much.